So, welcome back to the White Fox stage. And the next talk is something super interesting. It's about music. And imagine this you have a decade of additional data points and given off by more than 70 million monthly users who have created more than 13 billion personalized radio stations and given more than 95 billion thumbs. Yes, so we will now hear about how machine learning has been used at Pandora for the Music Genome Project. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Oscar Selma, head of research at Pandora. Hey, welcome everyone. Um, so I'm Oscar Selma, I'm the head of research at Pandora. And these are my nice slides that I prepared for you. It starts black. And then at some point, <laughs> there will be some slides here. Um, yeah. Nice. That's a nice start. Thank you all for coming. Um, I, flew, I flew all the way from San Francisco to present a very nice um, List set of slides that hopefully we'll be able to see in a minute if anyone can help me um, check in what is not uh, projecting slides. Um, so if any tech person can come here. Um, so yeah, I will talk today about uh, five lessons learned. So I've been working on recommender systems for many years, and then I started in academia, I did a PhD, and then I moved uh, to the industry. And I would like to share um, five lessons learned um, from this experience. It will be um, not really focused on Pandora per se, but it will be um, more like general. Of course, it was working before uh, during the break, but as usual, it doesn't work now. Um, Yeah, so um, I'm from Barcelona, <laughs> beautiful city. Uh, it's not as cold as Vienna, but it's also a beautiful city. I'm really happy to be here. As I said, uh, Pandora, we're based in Oakland, California, and it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. Nice. And this hasn't happened before to me. And I cannot tell any good joke, so. I mean, I could play guitar. If anyone wants to make a guitar, I can play some guitar meanwhile. But for now, we're just wasting some time here. Um, so uh, the five lessons learned, spoiler alert, um, one of them will be around like how big data is important, but if you don't have any big data, if you're like a startup, or if you're a, um, a smaller company that's starting, it's fine to not have big data. You can still do great things with like a smaller data set. That's one thing that I want to talk about. The second one, it will be about like selecting your uh, machine learning model. Like we can use deep learning. Deep learning is really cool and it works extremely fine. But when you move into production and you have to maintain such a complex system that requires you no. Know, Google Cloud Platform or any um, you know, big platform to, to maintain this and move it into production. And when you need to analyze like 70 million songs and have this system up and running, deep learning provides the best results. Deep learning is the one that has um, the most accuracy, but is also more complex in or, uh, when you want to put it into production compared to like simple logistic regression or compared to other more simple machine learning approaches. And I will talk a little bit about comparing this deep learning, um, the pros and cons um, versus more simple approaches. Um, then I would like to talk as well about like, how domain expertise is very important. So um, one of the takeaways that I want to mention is that on your machine learning team, it would be nice to have, or it's actually, I think it's mandatory to have uh, experts in the music domain, or no, for Netflix movies, for, um, 
for stick feeds, some, someone that loves clothing, or Amazon, books, etc. So I think it's important that you have machine learning expertise, not only generalists, but also people that like um, to uh, or love this domain, that they're musicians, or they love movies, or they, they're really into that. And then I'll justify um, why having domain expertise, it benefits um, uh, the outcome of your, of your uh, product. Yeah. yeah, I have it on Dropbox only. Okay. Nice. And how come it worked before and doesn't? I'd like to apologize for that. Um, yeah, you have it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, Woo! <laughs> That's good. Now you can see how organized is my desktop. <laughs> um, all right. Um, yeah. So what is Pandora? Pandora is the largest uh, music streaming in the US. We provide a, a personalized music experience for our listeners, but also we like to have, help the artists and content creators, as well as we have a large audio advertising platform that we monetize well. I will go probably quite fast now in the beginning. Um, Pandora is the biggest, you know, in the US, biggest um, music streaming service. People enjoy and spend time with Pandora a lot, like even more time than very well-known apps. And in terms of like usage and how many people use Pandora, this is data from early this year. Um, so Pandora is also big in the US. So, Five lessons learned building a large music recommender system. I would like to focus on from gathering the data, training and evaluating a model, to then deploy it and move it into production. So the first one, as I briefly hinted, is like big data is great, but if you have the right data, you can also do great things. So at Pandora, thanks for the introduction, we know that we have uh, 95 billion thumbs, 13 billion personalized stations, we have millions and millions of playlists that people have created as well. And every day we need to process one billion data points, like people skip this song, play this song, stop this song, um, play an ad or uh, play some, ad, send you a marketing email, click that email, send you push. So every day, one billion data points. So that's, I mean, of course, we're really proud and happy, but it's complex to process all that. You need like data engineering team. It's complex to have all this information. But of course, we can leverage that in a very, um, we can exploit this data really well. But you know, if you have a smaller data set, that's, a, that's an all example. It, it works. I built this um, Python Rexis library like eight years ago. But the goal here is like with a, a small data set of 360,000 users and just 18 million you know, users like these artists, you can apply. Um, matrix factorization, as it was presented by Ale Alexandros before, and by applying uh, matrix factorization, you can get decent results. Like for the Beatles, you get um, you know, all the members, uh, almost all the members from the Beatles, like a similar artist, um, because I don't know where's Ringo Starr, but you get a lot of like, nice combinations. And you have Klaatu, that's a band that was clearly influenced by the Beatles. So you, know, you can achieve some decent results, even if you don't have big data. That's the first takeaway. The second one that I want to talk about is you don't always need to choose the most accurate uh, machine learning model. There, there are trade-offs between, um, between different models. Like if you want a model that you can explain and tell your boss why it's working, why it's not working, you can go to stuff like, I mean, it's a probably an exaggeration, but like linear regression, decision trees, they are somewhat easy to explain and understand, but they are not as accurate as other approaches such as deep learning or complex ensemble methods. They are, 
They've improved to show like better performance, but it's more like a black box. So depending on, I mean, model selection is just, it's not just get the most accurate model, but it's also like a model that fits your needs for your business and for the product. So as an example, I will, at a 10,000 foot level, I will present how Pandora plays music, um, how we decide to play music for you at Pandora. It's both like an on-demand service, you can play all the music that you want, but we also, we're very well known for all the more like a laid back experience where we create the stations for you. Just type in Radiohead and we start playing music that you might love. So the first way to select songs to play for you at Pandora, it's based on, on, the, on the music itself. It's a content-based similarity, so we can find songs that sound similar to other songs. And actually, um, to do that, we have humans that have been annotated um, music since the 2000. So we have like 18 years of um, musicologists and musicians um, listening to songs one by one and annotating them. That's called the Music Genome Project. That's quite well known now. But having millions of songs as a ground truth, it allows us to, you know, uh, to go to over 70 million songs and have, uh, in this case, we have a deep learning approach that can just, given all the thousand albums we get every Friday as new releases, humans cannot annotate them all the songs. So what we do is we have this ground truth of songs annotated by humans and then we can predict and we can annotate these songs with what we call machine listening. So in this case, like given any song, we can predict if they have a piano or not and we create one model per attribute. We have up to 450 attributes that we can describe a song, like the voice, like hoarseness or nasal, like Bob Dylan. We can do a lot of um, very detailed annotations, and for each one of them, or close to um, most of these attributes, we have a machine listening model that predicts if the song has a piano there or not, if the, it's a male or female, has a guitar, what's the tempo, etc. And this helps us a lot, and then to connect all the songs and provide this content-based similarity. So it's a mix of humans and machines. As I said, deep learning, when you want to detect if, a piano, if there's a piano or not in a song, we apply the area under the curve as an evaluation metric. And yeah, deep learning works better than other approaches. But it's also, I mean, logistic regression, you can, in Java, you can implement this. And it just scales, and it's very simple to, to have a logistic regression uh, function. Deep learning is way more complex than that. but of course, it provides better results. So again, back to the, when you choose a model, depending on the complexity, depending on the resources you have, depending on how big is your team, you might decide to go to one option or, or another. So the second approach that we use at the high level is quality filtering. People that listen to this music or like this artist also like these other artists. And here we leverage this 95 billion thumbs that user has given us for the last 10 years. So once you have this vast amount of information of positive and negative signals, it's uh, very interesting how can you find similarities between artists. And then last but not least, we have a personalized filtering approach where like based on your thumbs, based on the music you like, based on your demographics, on you live, we take into account everything and then we decide which music to play for you. So all that, it's over 80 algorithms that fall into these three categories. And these 80 algorithms, we have an ensemble recommender on top of these 80 algorithms that decide right now, Oscar, on his favorite station, just thumbed down this song. And now, in real time, we have um, it's a very complex engineering system that in real time, between 50 and 80 milliseconds, we need to figure out what song to play for you. So we ask all these 80 algorithms, and then we we balance them, and we, we weigh them, um, and we decide which song to play. So that's how, the high level, how we play music at Pandora. So that was the second one. Um, it's great to use deep learning with us, uh, as I said, for the piano example, yes, best, uh, best performance, um, higher accuracy, but also <clears throat> complex to train, complex to move into production, complex to maintain compared to other approaches. So the third takeaway that I want uh, you to share is like when you have a, a machine learning model, you should optimize or you should focus on a relevant business, business metric. What do I mean by that is that, um, I mean, at Pandora, we have some business goals, we have our key performance indicators, we have our KPIs. 
And while my team and the ML experts focus on like, we improve the accuracy 2% or now, you know, uh, novelty is like 10% better. We have all these metrics, that's really cool. But then my boss is like, hey, you're all these smart scientists. No, can you get people to spend more time on the app? We need to increase our monthly active users. What's the user lifetime value? So this, this kind of misalignment between what's easier to compute or to, um, to focus on from the machine learning team versus the high-level metrics that uh, the execs want. So how can we bridge this gap and combine both? What we do at Pandora is we use offline evaluation all the time. So we use historical data based on, on the past, based on your thumbs, based on what you listen to, and we train the models offline. Um, and then we'll move these models online with A-B testing. So which metric can we use offline to make sure that people are happy or that they enjoy using the product? So as a proxy, we want to optimize the probability that you will thumb up a song. We like this because um, if we know which songs we think you might like, then you know, user satisfaction ideally increase, and then you're more happy to be using Pandora. But that's kind of the hypothesis. After offline, once we create our new model and we move it into, into the wild, we have um, online evaluation. So for online evaluation, A-B testing, we split the users between the treatment and the control group, and we see if there's any differences between the ones that are enjoying this new model, this new algorithm, the treatment group, versus the control one that cannot really um, enjoy this new approach, this new algorithm to play music. Or, um, so the metrics we focus on online evaluation, first is the activity. Are people thumbing more, skipping less? Um, when we send them audio ads or marketing campaigns or the click-through rate is higher. So that's kind of the activity. And, and that's very easy to measure. And it's very, in a couple of days, actually you can see move, movements there. Of course, if there's any bug, you will see this in, in an hour. You will see like numbers are totally like crazy and probably there's a bug there. Um, on the other hand, the retention metrics are more like long-term. We also measure on these AV experiments are people spending more time with the app when they start a session uh, at Pandora or their longer sessions, um, or they come in more often to Pandora that measure active days. So we run these experiments for months, actually, um, in some cases even over a year. And then the goal here is that on the short term, like in a few days, you can already see if there's any movement on like people like more this song or like there's any statistical difference between the, these activity metrics. But it will take months to see if this algorithm or this machine learning model actually had any impact on the time spent listening, on the active days, MAUs, etc. So that's the reason we keep this um, experiment running for months. And actually, we have a holdout group that we keep the whole year, 1% of the users that won't see any of these um, advances or, or new work that we've been doing. And by the end of the year, we can compare all the work that we've been doing with this 1%. And we can see, I can then tell my boss, see, with all these uh, algorithms, the, all the, all the work we did this year, we improved um, time spent listening by X percent or active days. So we can actually show the benefits of our model comparing with the holdout group. So that's, that was number three. Um, number four is. Um, I think it's very important that experimentation and production models are the same. What I mean by that is that you don't want your data science team in a corner and doing great things, but have no impact in the product. Why do you, why you don't want that? Because um, I think a data science team can add a lot of value, a lot of value to, uh, to the company, and you have them uh, working on something that is not really um, relevant, then it will be a problem. In order to limit that if they're doing a lot of experimentation and, and Python notebooks, but it's difficult to move that into production. It's more difficult than to have an impact and to put your stuff um, affecting, or affecting all the users. So what to, to limit this, at Pandora, we have the data scientists and the engineers working together since day one. And all the experimentation work and production, in the end, we use the same framework. We use the same tools when we're experimenting and when we're moving that into production. So that means that um, all our offline work, all our code that is offline, and we're testing that when we need to move it into production and uh, like online and testing with the users and actually 
launching that. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. We don't need to throw away all the work and have the engineers um, rebuild that. But instead, we're working together since day one. And I think that's really, really important to not have the separation between your data science team and your um, engineering and product organizations. More concretely, um, so when you have your offline models, you recompute them, you have data. Uh, every day we have like millions and millions of thumbs. So we recompute the model every night. And then once you recompute your model every night, you need to make sure whether the new model is better than the one you compute the night before or, or is worse. You need to, to make sure that, that there's no problems. Sometimes there's bugs. So when you're recomputing your model, you think, I think you need to watch out for different things. The first one is like, because you have your model that computes offline and have all these metrics, probability that you will like a song or like the accuracy or precision recall. We have all these metrics. The first thing you need to make sure is like with the model that you built last night, there's not like a delta error between the current model that's into production and the one that you created. I mean, sometimes there are bugs, sometimes there, there's some messy data, and you know, if you apply matrix factorization and the input is noise, then all the factors, all the embeddings go crazy and you get like bad results. So watch out if there's like a, a, the error between your current model in production and the new, and the new one that you should recompute um, has like a large delta error. Um, sometimes if you have a model uh, based on logistic regression, for instance, and then you move into deep learning, that's a big, big change. So you want to make sure that not only the offline results are similar, there's like similar you know, range of error, but also you want to make sure that the impact on the users, it's minimal or, or there's no big effect there. So for that, what we do is what is called the AA testing. So we have both models into the wild to use some part of the users are experiencing um, the current model or the DL1 actually. And then if we do some fancy deep learning, other part of the users will be getting this new deep learning. And we'll be running both uh, models at the same time. And this AA prime um, online testing will tell us if like one model versus the other are like similar or better or worse instead of just because the offline tell us that the results are very similar. You don't want just to just launch it. You want to make sure that the users also don't experience something wrong, especially because maybe the new model is adding a lot of bad results or WTF or things that you don't want in your, in your system or in your radio. And then the way to catch all this is um, exposing to users, running both systems for a while, and make sure that um, there are no statistical differences in the metrics that we measure. Sometimes there, there are big catalog changes. Um, uh, if Netflix has a new deal with uh, some uh, movies, uh, like uh, producers, and they get a lot of movies, probably they need to uh, be careful because the models need to be retrained. There's a cost star problem, a lack of data for this new stuff. At Pandora, we have a new deal with, uh, with an indie um, record label. Then there's a lot of new content there, a lot of items, songs, artists that we know nothing. So you also need to make sure that um, if there's like big changes in your catalog or in your, on the, the things that you're recommending, um, you need to watch out. When you're recompeting these models nightly, make sure that if you added a lot of music last night or the day before, there's no like, weird uh, results based on that. So you need to pay attention. And the last one is uh, when there are signals in the UI, like there's a new button. or It's interesting how you slightly change the, the UI or the UX, and then all of a sudden the models don't work, and maybe you add uh, a new signal. We had thumbs up, thumb down, you have a skips. And then we added, you can replay a song, or you can listen to music offline. So it's likely adding one button, it just changes the way people use your app, and then all your system was, or your machine learning model was biased or trained towards some particular type of data. You change a little bit the UI, and then all the data is different and the machine learning model doesn't know anything about that so you also <clears throat> also need to be very aligned with product and design any changes in the ui will affect your model and you need to be careful of be aware of that um, then the last uh, the last mm, learning that i want to share with you is um, i think domain expertise is crucial in a machine learning model, a team, sorry, you know, and in any machine learning team, domain expertise is very important. What I mean by that is that um, it's good to have people that are passionate about 
music, about movies, about anything. Um, but like the things that you're recommending, it's really good that you have someone in your team that really cares and loves and is passionate. Um, so music actually is very special, but so it's movies and books. I mean, the, each domain is very special. But why is music so different if you want from other type of recommendations? Um, I mean, Netflix has a hundreds of thousands maybe of things to recommend. We're talking about like millions and millions of songs and hundreds of thousands of artists. So like the, the domain of recommendations just explodes for music. Um, well, <clears throat> when we play something bad, there's this highly emotional connection like, why are you playing this for me now? Like, the, the people are very passionate about music um, and you need to be aware of that. And each user is different. You need to learn what she likes, what she prefers to listen to, at what time. Music is also short time consumption, like songs are like three to five minutes song, um, length, three to five minutes uh, yeah, time, unless you like Ramones, like one to two minutes and then you're, you're done. But like songs are very short time. So the investment of w watching a movie or reading a book is like, okay, I want to watch this movie now with my partner, my son, like it's an investment Saturday night. If we play a bad song, you just skip it and you waste like 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, it's less, I mean, there's way, way, way more interaction in the music domain. People like to listen to the same song over and over, like 10 times, and then they thumb it down later. Like, what does this mean? Like, they, they love this music, but then all of a sudden they skip it or they don't want to listen to it anymore. So there's this kind of obsessed consumption in some cases. Music allows for rediscovery, something that you listened to 20 years ago, now we play it again, it just triggers memories. So it's really interesting, like the fact that has, also music is like, has this lean back versus lean in consumption, like lean back, hey Pandora, play music that I like, and we just do it for you, and you just enjoy, you provide some feedback, thumbs up, thumbs down, etc. versus lean in, hey, I wanna create a playlist, and we actually help in an effortly way we help uh, users to create uh, playlists in a very um, fast and easy way. And also music is very context specific. Like when, like when you're in the morning going to the gym, it's not the same as in the evening when you're like winding down for dinner or like Sunday morning uh, with family type of listening. So there's a lot of contextual stuff that you need to pay attention. So what I tell my team actually is like, because you're a domain expert, your main goal is to teach AI to not do stupid things. Because, I mean, uh, this machine, this uh, AI, deep learning, whatever, has actually no, lacks reasoning, doesn't have any com common sense. So it might, it might happen that you do something like that, that um, we might play this song that you will hear now. Imagine what happens if we play this song in a, let's say, contemporary Christian rock station. This actually, maybe it happened to us once. So, uh, I mean, you need a lot of uh, you need a lot of domain expertise. You need people that, or I mean, the machine won't know that there's some stuff that it's appropriate or it's unappropriate. We're not talking about explicit lyrics or not explicit. Like it's not in the metadata per se. Like we don't know this, but it's based on like other more other factors. So just to wrap it up as a summary, I hope some of these lessons that I learned it resonates. One or two maybe resonates with you. Um, big data is really, really important, really useful, but if you don't have it, you can still do a lot of things with that. Deep learning, it's really important. We use it a lot, but you know, it's costly and it's like it's difficult to maintain, it's expensive. Um, and sometimes you might want to go with an easier model. Um, the number three is like, you know, try to measure things that in the end your boss cares about. Number four, um, you want to reinvent the wheel from experimentation into production. You want to have a team embedded with engineers. So the transition from experimentation into the while, um, it's uh, not disruptive. And number five, uh, I guess, don't play highway to hell in, in particular stations. So thank you very much. So. Thank you, Dr. Selma, for this amazing talk. And before we do the Q&A, we wanted to do a stage selfie. So please oh. wave and no, be look, in the selfie. Maybe like this, thumbs up. Yeah, thumbs with up, a yeah. thumbs up for the thumb for the Pandora. And here, 
We. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have time for one question because afterwards is a lunch break, but. Yeah. Um, thankfully, the lunch break will be better than yesterday. We apo apologize again for the situation yesterday. So we have put a lot more staffs on the uh, queue so that the queue management will be better. And the food will be served until there is food. So don't worry. Don't go yet, please. And we will do one question. Which one would you like to answer? I will definitely not talk about the third one. Um, I will focus on the first and second. Um, uh, the first one, what are you using for converting? Uh, Awesome. Okay. How, how would you cope with the user presenting consistent behavior like sometimes listen to metal, classical music? Okay, me too, actually. <laughs> More like hard rock than metal. So uh, that's a good question. I think I wouldn't call that inconsistent behavior. Sometimes we like heavy metal, sometimes we like classical music. I don't think it's inconsistent per se. So what Pandora what we have is what we call the, a listener taste profile or a user profile where we know that we can cluster your, all your listening by, by genres if you want, or we cluster them by um, no, this area, like sometimes you listen to heavy metal, sometimes you listen to classical music, so we know we have different personas, if you want, per user. So Oscar listen to Oscar when, when it's onto the metal music wall. Oscar is in the classical music, and we kind of decompose this into different sub-personas, and then we take that into account when we make recommendations. So we actually go one level down. We don't aggregate everything, but we can split you into different clusters. What are you using for converting sound to music? Um, that's a good question. Um, so we have, yeah, uh, we do, uh, we've done a lot of stuff on MSCCs. I guess the question is like, are you, is the input of your deep learning model just the raw audio, the raw mm -hmm. waveform, or is like some transformation over previous work? And that's a lot of, kind of in the research community, there's a lot of you know, um, questions of what, which one is the best. Um, we start with like what is called here MSCCs, but it's mainly instead of having the waveform, we move that into a, what is called the spectral domain. So we have the time and pitch, like the, the notes, if you want. And then we start doing a lot of work there. But it's true that now just entering the raw audio matrix into a generic CNN, it actually works as well and sometimes even before. So not a, not, I don't have a good answer. Like you can use either MSCCs or do nothing, and actually it's not clear which one performs the best, though. My sense with the recent work we've been doing is like the raw audio, um, it's, yeah, it works better. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, just one last thing, because I think it is maybe helpful to know for all the audience here who can't use Pandora yet here in Europe, yeah. what can I do with Pandora that I can't do with Spotify? And <laughs> when, I, when will it be available? <laughs> Thank you. That's the, the, that was the one that I said I, I won't I I answer. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Nice moderator. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's so many things. Let me see. I mean, there's not only Pandora and Spotify. There's Apple Music, Amazon Music. There's YouTube. There's a lot of, a lot of options out there. I think um, I, I don't want to compare. What I like about Pandora is like the motto is like we do it for you. So when you're creating a playlist, for instance, we're also on demand. Like you add a couple of songs and then just click like finish this playlist and we recommend a lot of things for you to fill in. When we create playlists for you, um, we create like your happy soundtrack, we create um, your dinner soundtrack. Instead of being curated by humans that you know your happy soundtrack and it's for all of us the same, what we do is we create one playlist for each one of you and that's your dinner soundtrack. And maybe in my case, it's like classical music with some heavy metal. So, but each one of you will have a different personalized playlist. So we do it very effortlessly, we do it for you. And uh, whilst I respect all the competition, I think uh, Pandora has a lot of, um, very personalized, highly personalized algorithms that allows you to do nothing, just go to Pandora, and you will always have something to play for you. That's impressive. Thank you very much, and we're really looking forward. And please give a round of applause again to Dr. Selma.